let's talk about the truth tables for these two new uh, new friends, implication and equivalence. Um, and I want to focus on the one for equivalence first because that will be simpler to understand, I think. So let's see, for phi and psi, the possibilities are these four. And then what does that mean for the proposition phi if and only if psi? All right, now I would suggest uh, if you have had any practice with truth tables, uh, pause the video and see if you can guess what you would put here. Uh, see if you can get that right. Okay, so here's the answer. The truth value of phi and psi are linked by the equivalence. The equivalence says that the equivalence is true precisely when phi and psi have the same truth value. So if they're both false, the equivalence is true. If they're both true, the equivalence is true. Otherwise, if phi and, and psi differ in their truth value, then the equivalence fails. All right, I think that's not so, uh, not so complicated or surprising. But the truth table for implication usually throws people off a little bit, and it's worth a solid discussion. So let me fill this thing out again. All right, and our goal is to uh, fill out in each of the four situations what, whether phi implies psi is true or not. So um, one way to think about this intuitively to try to come up with what the answer ought to be is to just imagine that you have um, that, you know, in, say in this first case, that phi and psi are both false. And then someone goes up to you and says, hey, if phi is true, then psi is true. Then what would you say in that situation where you are aware that phi and psi are both false? Would you say that that person lied to you or that they told the truth? So that could be a way to know if this is T or, or F here. So let me, let me make a more like explicit example. Okay, let's, let's say phi is you washed your hands and psi is you did not get infected. And then uh, in each of these rows, we're thinking about a different truth situation for phi and psi. So let's try, I think the, the bottom row here is maybe the easiest one. Let's suppose that phi and psi are both true. So you in fact did wash your hands and you in fact did not get infected. Then what would you say about someone who says, if you washed your hands, you did not get infected? Uh, are they telling the truth? I think everyone would say yes, they're telling the truth. Um, what about this one? I think this one is another straightforward one. Suppose you washed your hands, but you got infected anyway. Then what would you say about someone who says, if you washed your hands, then you did not get infected? They have told a lie, right? They said, if you washed your hands, you did not get infected. and the hypothetical that they laid out, if you washed your hands, uh, applied. You did in fact wash your hands. And they said that it would follow them that you did not get infected, but you did get infected, making them a liar. Now, these are more difficult, um, especially this one. A lot of people disagree about what to put there, but this one is maybe a little bit easier. So let's suppose that someone says, if you washed your hands, then you did not get infected. And in reality, you did not wash your hands and you did get infected. Could you call that person a liar? Definitely not. They're not a liar. And in fact, we say that they have told the truth. Partly because the hypothetical that they laid out, they said, if you washed your hands, then you did not get infected. This is, we're talking about a situation where you didn't even wash your hands. So you didn't meet the condition for what they said to, uh, to require you to, to not get infected for them to be telling the truth. Okay, so 
This one takes a little bit more thinking, but usually people agree with this. This is the one where people have a lot of trouble. So what should go here? Definitely something should go here. Something should go here. Um, because of excluded middle. We know, due to excluded middle, that this proposition is either true or false. It can't be something in between. Maybe in conversational logic sometimes it can be, but definitely not in mathematical logic. And we're, we need to put something here. And you can't say it depends on the situation. It shouldn't depend on something other than phi and psi. It's a, it's a proposition that is built out of nothing but phi and psi. So something definitely needs to go here. What does it end up being? True. We consider this to be true. Okay, so if you are already thoroughly convinced of this, then, then you can stop this video here um, and just know that uh, when an implication is true due to the hypothesis being false, we say the implication is vacuously true. Just accept that terminology and then you can stop the video. However, I'd like to spend the rest of the video um, convincing you of this fact. And actually, I guess you still need to watch the rest of the video to get uh, to get the rule contradictions are powerful. So at least uh, watch for long enough to pick that up. Okay, so why, why, why does true go here? Um, so we had to make a choice, and I want to convince you that this is not just an arbitrary choice. Uh, in fact, with the rules that we have so far, the only thing that can go here is true. You cannot put anything else and be consistent with the rules that we've laid out so far. So if you agree so far with the, with the setup, um, that it's a good setup, then you must accept this. So hopefully I can convince you of that. So first I want to take uh, a detour and we'll come back to the question actually. So we'll come back to why this should be true. But first I want to go through uh, a sort of review how proof by contradiction works. So if you, if in an argument, if you say, if you want to prove, um, say, phi, uh, say you assume phi is true, suppose that phi is true, um, then you say a bunch of stuff, you make an argument, blah, 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 and then eventually you say, therefore, your argument leads you to conclude something like this, C and not C, so you reach a contradiction, then overall you can reject phi, right? So overall, you can say therefore not phi. So if you assume something, then get a contradiction, then you can conclude that what you assumed at the beginning must have been false. This is how proof by contradiction works. Um, now, what if a contradiction ended up actually being true? So here, like here you see a contradiction getting deduced, right? But that doesn't mean it's true because it's getting deduced in this block of arguments that's part of this larger block of arguments where there's this assumption. Suppose that phi is true. So the, the contradiction that was deduced here, you wouldn't say it's true. Uh, overall, you would say it's true under the assumption phi. And then the technique proof by contradiction or the rule of proof by contradiction would allow you to then reject phi. So this is not a situation where a contradiction is true. This is a situation where a contradiction is true under the hypothetical situation where phi is true. But now I want to ask, what if a contradiction were just true with no other assumptions? Like, what if someone wrote down a mathematical argument with no assumptions, so a bunch of talking, blah, 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 but no assumptions, no suppose this or that, just deduction from the axioms. And they ended up concluding, thus, um, C and not C. What would that mean for mathematics? So if this became a theorem, this was proven, what would that mean for mathematics? So what happens? 
in this situation? Well, it's definitely something we hope can never happen, actually, right? Because that would really, really uh, demonstrate that things don't mean what we think they meant, or our logical, you know, our deduction system is not consistent. Something is wrong if this happens. But let's just imagine, what if it did happen? Um, then what does that mean for the rest of mathematics? Well, suppose it happened. Suppose someone proved psi and not psi. Then I claim all propositions have proofs. With the rules we have so far, if someone actually managed to prove a contradiction, then any proposition that you can write down that's grammatical can be proven using proof by contradiction. So let me demonstrate. Suppose, so this is not a proof, but this is part of the hypothetical meta situation that I'm having you imagine. Say someone managed to prove this C and not C. And say you have a proposition in mind. Um, so um, say you want to prove that pigs can fly. Um, so here is a proof that pigs can fly. Theorem. Pigs can fly. Proof. Suppose, for the sake of contradiction, that pigs cannot fly. Okay, now if I want to apply proof by contradiction, if I want to apply that rule to deduce that pigs can fly, I must somehow argue that a contradiction uh, follows. But I'm imagining now that someone actually managed to prove a contradiction without any assumptions, without even using my assumption that pigs cannot fly. So someone just found an argument that always works to prove psi and not psi. I haven't specified what psi is, it's not important, but someone proved that a certain thing happens to tr be both true and not true. So whatever their argument was, I can insert it into here, or I can just, you know, reference their result and say, we already know, it is already known, that psi and not psi. Um, thus we have reached a contradiction. It's a really weird way to reach a contradiction since I didn't even use the assumption that pigs cannot fly, but uh, nothing in the rule about proof by contradiction requires that I make use of the assumption. So using the rule proof by contradiction, the theorem is proven. Therefore, pigs can fly. Okay, so step back and think about what happened. If someone manages to prove a contradiction, then you can write down anything you want here. It doesn't have to be about pigs flying. It could be any proposition. It could even be pigs cannot fly, and then you could write down a, a valid proof for that. So we could prove both that pigs can fly and that pigs cannot fly, and that... Um, goats always have 20 legs, and that they also don't always have 20 legs, and basically any proposition you can come up with uh, is both true and is false because its negation is true. Uh, everything is broken if someone manages to prove a contradiction. This is not totally hypothetical. It has actually happened in the history of mathematics that people have come up with um, systems of deduction and tried to build up set theory using their, their system, and they had a lot of fun with it, people published papers about it, and eventually someone publishes a paper that contradicts someone else's paper. And take the conjunction of the two results and you have an actual contradiction. So this has happened before. When it happens, you can see how bad it is. It doesn't just feel bad to have a logical inconsistency um, ending up being true in your system. It it really breaks everything in the sense that now everything is proven. So 
the game is just not fun anymore, right? Everything is now true and false. So this rule is in the notes, I'll show you. So uh, here it is in the notes. Um, and I think it looks like I swapped the roles of phi and psi in the, in the explanation just now, but this is the idea. So this is a rule, and I'm calling it a derived rule because we actually just deduced it using proof by contradiction. So it doesn't have to be a new rule, it's just a consequence of our, of our current rules. And it says, look, if, you, if someone has proven a contradiction, then from that you can deduce anything you want, any psi you want. Pigs can fly, pigs cannot fly, everything. Okay, back to our original question then. What do we do for this strange row in the truth table for implication? Uh, suppose that you did not wash your hands and you did not get infected. Okay, so dirty hands, you never wash your hands, and you did not get infected. That's possible, right? So imagine that that happened. Someone says, if you washed your hands, then you did not get infected. Let's prove that they are telling the truth. Um, at least when, when the if-then you're using is the, the if-then of mathematical logic. So suppose that you did not wash your hands and that you also did not get infected. Then let's prove this implication is true. So how do I prove an implication? The rule is, to prove an implication, I should assume the hypothesis of the implication, and then prove the conclusion. So here, I'll say, claim. I claim that phi does imply psi. And here's the proof. I must assume the hypothesis, assume that phi. And then I need to prove the conclusion, psi. But look. I'm in a situation where I have supposed that not phi, right? I have supposed that uh, you did not wash your hands, and now I'm assuming you did wash your hands. So then you did and didn't wash your hands. That is a contradiction. Because of that rule, contradictions are powerful. by derived rule, uh, what was it, six? By this derived rule, we can conclude anything we want now, absolutely anything. We want to conclude psi, so let's just conclude that. Psi is true. And that's it. That proves that phi implies psi. So I could also conclude not psi is true here. You know, I can conclude anything or omega for any proposition omega. Okay, um, so to kind of summarize the argument, if it's not the, if phi is false and psi is true, then here's the proof that phi implies psi. If you assume that phi holds, then phi both holds and doesn't hold. That's a contradiction which lets you deduce anything. In particular, it lets you deduce that psi holds. I should point here. In particular, it lets you deduce that psi holds. So overall, from an assumption of phi, you can deduce psi. Here's one reason that this might be intuitive, uh, that you might find this to be intuitive. If someone says, if you washed your hands, then you did not get infected, and you are someone who did not even wash your hands, then the statement they're making doesn't even apply to you. They didn't make a statement about you. So 
because you are someone who did not wash your hands, it doesn't matter whether you get infected or not. You will not make them out to be a liar, because they said, if you washed your hands. So, no matter what, if the hypothesis is false, an implication will always end up being true. And when this happens, so I, so I hope you're seeing um, that implications are much more often true than false. And when it happens, so there's these two ways in which implications can be true due to the hypothesis being false. And there's this other way that an implication can be true by the hypothesis being true and the conclusion being true. So either the hypothesis is false, that makes the implication true, or both hypothesis and conclusion hold, and that makes the implication true. If an implication is true for the first reason, because the hypothesis is false, then you say the implication is vacuously true. Vacuously. So it's kind of like a truth, but it's an empty truth. That's how I think about it. Um, it was true because the, you know, the, the, the person who said, if you wash your hands, you do not get infected, was correct simply because you did not wash your hands. So there was nothing to check their statement against in the first place. And I don't know if this would have a name. It's just, it's just not vacuously true, but not vacuously. All right. So that's the truth table for implications.